Hello, today we're going to be going over ethology. Uh, ethology is correlated to Campbell's uh, chapter 51. So, ethology is the study of behavior, animal behaviors, and behavior can be defined as the response to a stimulus. Uh, in animals, usually behavior is carried out with help or control from the nervous or endocrine systems. Behaviors will help with maintenance of homeostasis. So it can help animals reproduce, get them uh, to reproduce. It also helps to make quick decisions in life or death scenarios and will control growth and uh, development. Uh, you can think about your own life, what behaviors you may do, uh, either unconsciously or consciously. For example, if you react to a certain stimulus, let's say you have a test and you start sweating because you didn't study, that is a form of behavior. It is uh, probably cr uh, brought on by uh, both the endocrine and nervous systems. So the study of such behaviors, why they happen or how they happen, is the field of ethology. So kind of arcing back off of what I said, uh, there's kind of two different uh, main categories for explaining behavior. The first one is proximate causation. It's basically how does this behavior work? And then there's the other one, ultimate causation. Why? Uh, pro proximate caus causation, how a behavior occurs or is modified. And this can be environmental stimulus. It can also be mechanisms, the what goes on behind the behavior. Whereas ultimate causation is looking more at kind of the evolutionary significance of the behavior that's being studied. Uh, studies on proximate causation was started by Tim Bergen and it earned him a share of the Nobel Prize. So we're, most of the topics that we discuss here are kind of based off of his his stuff. So first we'll start off with fixed action patterns. These are a sort of certain type of behavior that are innate. They don't have to be learned and they're kind of behavioral sequences that will run to completion once started. These uh these are again not learned so it's not like you learn to do something because of a stimulus. It's more of that it's inborn. It's an inborn trait that you'll just go through the action. An example is uh, birds feeding their baby birds. There was once a, a USABO question on this topic. They had a picture of a bird feeding a fish. And then they asked you what type of behavior is that? That was fixed action potentials because the uh, bird is inborn with the behavior to go feed their child a uh, younger bird but if the younger bird's not there the fish serves as the stimulus and then it creates the same sort of uh, fixed action pattern uh, the stimulus that starts a fixed action pa uh, pattern is known as the sign stimuli usually they're external triggers it can be visual can also be in different things, but greater stimulus usually will lead to a larger response. So kind of the example given beyond the bird is the red back stickle, uh, stickle back fish. These are uh, types of fish with kind of spines on their back and then they exhibit a form of, a form of fixed action pattern in that they'll attack anything with a red underside. So you can see in the diagram down there, even if they give a rock with a red belly to the fish, the fish is going to attack that rock because the rock serves as a sti sign stimulus and will uh, create that fixed action pattern. Another one is migration. Environmental stimulus can uh, also trigger the movement of animals. So for example, you know, birds, fishes, other animals, they'll also uh, undergo migration by certain changes in their environment. This can be through different factors such as like lighting, sun, uh, you know, the birds will kind of reorient themselves by the sun's position. 
they can some animals do that by means of the circadian clock which is an internal kind of clock that uh, has a 24 hour cycle and if there's no like sun there's also a different stimulus that animals can take such as uh, nocturnal animals can use the north star certain animals use the um, magnetic field earth's magnetic field to also uh, kind of uh, configure their migration. Behavioral rhythms are kind of fixed interval repetitions that control the behavior. These can be beyond the uh, circadian rhythm that we're talking about, but it can be also like circ circannual rhythm, which is basically by seasons. And then an example is the fiddler crab. The fiddler crab uses uh, the lunar cycle, and they kind of will migrate based off of the waves, how deep it is, which is also linked to the uh, moon. About uh, So moving on, those are behaviors uh, from the stimulus and the environment, right? Uh, fixed action p pattern, migration, uh, and the other one, behavioral rhythms, they all are usually in response to some environmental feature. It could be lighting, could be magnetic fields, right? But these new ones, uh, the, the ones we're covering now, signals and communication, they're more of signals that are uh, transferred between organisms. So uh, you can think of it, you know, when when you talk to someone, or you're communicating with them, you're sending different stimulus, they can respond differently based off of what stimulus you give them. For us, it's language, mostly, and then you have some sort of, uh, sometimes the visual ways. But communication is the transferring of these uh, signals or stimuli. And these can be found in different ways. One way is a stimulus response chain. It's kind of a chain reaction, but one stimulus will serve to activate another stimulus. And FASA creates a a chain reaction. Uh, in general, the, the communication that an uh, animal has is kind of related to the animal's lifestyle and environment. So, uh, for example, when you look at the bees here, they're doing a form of communication through dance. You can uh, kind of see the image on the right. But based on the direction and the shape of the dance they're doing, they can communicate with other bees about different uh, environmental things. Uh, this is, you know, analogous to us, our language. It's a form of communication, transferring signals. But for the bees, they find that, uh, for example, if you look at look the picture titled Location C, it's at a uh, 30 degree angle from the sun. That uh, communicates to the other bees that the bee doing the dance has found some object at uh, a 30 degree angle from the sun. And then you have a different way of communicating through pheromones. Uh, these are odors or tastes, chemicals that are released by organisms and are uh, serve as stimulus for other organisms. For example, if you have Fruit flies, uh, when they court, they also do the, they, they release pheromones and they usually, the male fruit fly will tap the female with the foreleg and then that kind of releases the chemicals. They, pheromones uh, can also serve for uh, alarm signals. If you, there's a kind of experiment where uh, they put minnows into a aquarium, minnows, the, the fish type, and then they put in the water tank and then they inject some pheromones into the water near the top and then all the fish would congregate at the bottom because they are trying to avoid the pheromone being introduced. And yeah, they also work as reproductive uh, signals if that was not clear with the fruit fly example. So kind of going on to the next one, taxis, kinesis. Uh, taxis uh, involves 
kind of turning the animal's body relative to a stimulus, it also just means movement. Right, so the summary of it is it's just taxes is directional movement towards something. There's uh, two types. There's positive taxis, which is moving towards stimuli. There's negative taxis, which is moving away from the stimuli. Uh, and then you have uh, kinesis, which is just non-directional changes. There can be changes in activity or rate. Uh, these taxes, uh, they don't have to be really just uh, like physical. It can be from something else. For example, you have chemotaxis. Uh, you can see in the diagram that chemotaxis is a directional movement, right? And chemokinesis, it's not really, there's no direction specified. It can be random. Uh, chemota uh, chemotaxis, if you uh, don't know, is kind of the movement or orientation of an organism. Or here, a cell that uh, it's along a chemical gradient, and they either move towards or away from that gradient. So moving on from behaviors, we're going to kind of go over uh, learning, right? Behaviors, most of what we've covered so far are just responses to stimuli. Some of them are uh, more straightforward, I guess. But like, for example, the fixed action pattern, they'll always occur due to one stimulus. Uh, these, But these behaviors, they can be, you know, developed unlike the fixed action patterns. And this is through processes such as learning. Learning can uh, kind of establish these links or uh, bonds between experiences and behavior. So, the first one we're going to co uh, cover is imprinting. Uh, some of you may know this term. Imprinting is kind of the ability of uh, an animal to recognize and be recognized by their parent. Uh, this happens usually when the uh, animal is young and there's a certain time period known as a sensitive period and it's only then that imprinting can occur. But usually in nature, imprinting will occur on the actual parent, but if you are in a controlled setting, you can change that. So you can swap the parent out for like a rock and then things will, uh, the animal will imprint on that object. So you can, uh, the diagram or picture on the right, that's a, <laughs> it's a scientist with, I think, geese, uh, baby geese, but the geese have imprinted on him and thus they follow him around. Imprinting is a sort of uh, innate behavior, just uh, you don't, uh, it's just uh, developed normally. So next we're going to talk about spatial learning. Spatial learning is uh, learning based off of the environment, kind of just recognizing and taking in the uh, stimulus from the environment structure. So this usually will require uh, landmarks, right? If you go outside, uh, you might recognize certain locations or learn to avoid certain locations by certain landmarks they have. For example, you know you're at school if you see Mission Spell. Um, uh, but the example here on the right that we're given is the, that of a wasp. And here, this is kind of showing the how animals may learn by spatial learning. The wasp's nest is surrounded by a bunch of pine cones. So these pine cones kind of serve as the, uh, the landmarks that uh, the wasp recognizes. So usually when the wasp flies around and comes back to the pine cones, the nest will be in the center as seen in the diagram. But if you move these pine cones out, uh, the wasp will fly towards the pine cone and not the nest itself because it learns to associate the kind of the two locations together. So if you change it, then it's going to find the landmark first. And some animals, uh, spatial learning will kind of create a cognitive map, which is in the animal's nervous system. It's a bunch of it's a representation of spatial relationships between objects. And then moving on uh, here, we're going to talk about associative learning. This is, again, making associations between two different or sometimes multiple stimulus 
And for us, you can kind of think of it analogous to uh, mnemonic devices. So if you have something you want to memorize, but you want to kind of find an easier way to do that, then you can create these mnemonics to remember them. For example, the famous math one, PEMDAS. Um, usually, associative learning will be done with cogn uh, con conditioning. And what we usually think of learning is associative. So moving on to specific types, the first one we're going to cover is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is kind of training a new stimulus to create a response. Uh, here you'll see a kind of a lot of terms to think about. So we're going to start off simpler. Uh, the first line, unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response, this is just basic behavior. Uh, for example, uh, we're going to use the example of a dog. If you give a dog food, that's the unconditioned stimulus, then it will salivate, that's the unconditioned response. Right? The food causes salivation. But let's say you wanted to add a new stimulus to create the dog to salivate. Uh, this new sim stimulus, let's say it's a bell, that's the neutral stim uh, stimulus, and then you'll kind of apply at the same time as the unconditioned stimulus, so the two kind of get associated with each other by the dog. So in our case, that was the bell and the food, uh, respectively. So eventually that bell becomes the conditioned stimulus, that's what the second line means. Uh, with enough conditioning, that conditioned stimulus will uh, be able to create the conditioned response by itself. So in the end, that's uh, equivalent to our bell ringing, being able to make the dog salivate. So kind of what we just described is what Ivan Pavlov did when he was researching into the subject. That was the kind of the famous dog experiment, Pavlov dog. He was able to condition the dog to salivate using a bell. And in that diagram on the bottom, you can see a more visual representation of how classical conditioning works. Again, uh, here, th these are abbreviations. UCS is unconditioned stimulus. UCR, unconditioned response. Neuro neutral stimulus is uh, NS. And then uh, CS is conditional conditioned stimulus. CR is conditioned response. And just to go over it again, uh, the unconditioned stimulus is the food, which creates the unconditioned response, which is salivation. You'll pair the neutral stimulus, which is the bell, and the unconditioned stimulus, which is the food. And enough conditioning, then that bell becomes the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned stimulus will be able to give you the conditioned response, which is salivation. Uh, the next type, operant conditioning, is a bit different in how it works. Operant conditioning is learning through punishments and reinforcements. So reinforcements are ways to increase behavior. This is These are actions that you'll take to kind of solidify some behavior that you want. Uh, examples include uh, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. Um, if we use the, the scenario on the bottom of a mouse in a box, then positive reinforcement becomes uh, adding pleasurable stimuli that the mouse likes. So that would be food. You can put food into the dispenser that becomes the positive reinforcement for behavior. And then um, kind of going off of that, we're, uh, I'm going to explain punishments first so that we can relate the two ideas. But punishments are ways to decrease behavior. It might be kind of uh, confusing because you'll think punishment is always negative, right? But there's also two types. There's positive punishment, there's negative, pun uh, negative punishment. I should say punishment. And these two uh, punishments and reinforcements are what are able to kind of solidify or have an animal learn a certain behavior. So let's say we wanted your mouse to do a backflip. So <clears throat> you'll train your mouse to do that. And once your mouse does its first uh, backflip, then you want to give reinforcement to it because you want that mouse to continue doing backflips. 
So you can give it positive reinforcement. As I said before, you'll give it food. But let's say uh, the next time, instead of doing a backflip, your rat rolls over, and you don't want that rat to roll over. Then there's kind of different ways you're able to uh, decrease that behavior. You can either add unpleasurable stimuli, which is um, an electric shock, or you can do negative punishment, which is removing something that the mouse likes. So, okay, let me say that again. A po positive punishment is unpleasurable. You would add a electric shock to the mouse to stop it from rolling over. But negative punishment, you would remove something that the mouse likes, so you would remove food. Both ways are punishments, so they would hopefully work to decrease the behavior of rolling over. And then, uh, let's say the mouse, after you shock it, uh, does a backflip again. Now you want to, again, remove, uh, or you want to increase the behavior, and how you do that is you'll remove the unpleasurable stimulus. So that's negative reinforcement, and you're going to remove electric shocks. So, yeah, operant conditioning is kind of confusing, uh, the different types of reinforcement punishments, but again, in summary, positive reinforcement will add pleasurable stimulus, can be food. Negative reinforcement will remove unpleasant stimulus, which will be removing electric shocks. Uh, for punishments, you have positive punishment, which is adding the unpleasant stimulus, so you'll add the shock to the mouse. And negative punishment is removing the pleasurable stimulus, so you'll remove uh, the food from the mouse. This is kind of known as trial and error learning. And the more kind of famous example of operant conditioning is the Skinner box, which was the setup that we were using. That's a way to uh, kind of train a mouse through operant conditioning. And you can see a small summary of the different types of punishments and reinforcements that we were talking about there. So it's common for students to kind of get confused on classical and operant conditioning, which is why I spent more time on them. But again, classical conditioning is kind of uh, pairing stimulus together, and the operant is using punishments and reinforcements to get a behavior. And we'll go over them kind of later in the quiz. But here we have, uh, we're going to move on to habituation. Habituation is the learning to lose a responsive responsiveness to stimulus. Uh, so, for example, the plant there, the leaves will curl up if you touch it, but if you touch it too many times, then it'll stop curling up because it realizes that each stimulus of you touching it uh, doesn't have much uh, meaning to it. It doesn't convey important information, so it just stops uh, responding. But the stimulus can be reconditioned, and the habituation can be like undone, so eventually it would start curling up again. And then we have social learning. Uh, social learning is, well, as it sounds, learning through social ways. Um, this occurs in social creatures. Many animals will um, learn by observing the behavior of other individuals. And usually, you know, when we talk about this, we talk about apes or humans because we, we have social classes and as such we can do this. Uh, but here, uh, because of social, we, we're social creatures and we learn by social interaction, it's con sometimes considered one of the worst punishments to do social shaming. Uh, this is kind of moving into psychology, but... Uh, I think it's useful. And uh, the diagram kind of on the right, I'm going to talk about that first. This is uh, the Harlow monkey experiment, but it was uh, a setup where two uh, fake monkey mothers were created, and then a real baby monkey was uh, given to both of them. But the, you can see on the left the wireframe thing is the is one of the monkey mutters, but it's purposely made to be kind of uncomfortable and uh, weird looking. 
but however, this this uh, monkey had food for the baby monkey to eat, whereas the one on the right is kind of blocked by the monkey, but the baby monkey, but that uh, mother thing on the right is more comfortable for that baby, but it does not have food. So kind of what it's showing is <clears throat> the learning is it or development is it nature or is it nurture? And one thing we learn is it's both. So you can see the the baby monkey it ended up uh, staying with the more comfortable mom on the right for most of the time, but when it needed food, it would crawl over to the left one. So it would use it, it would uh, you know develop through both nature and nurture. And then, you know, through social learning, we're able to pass on information to others. Uh, this is commonly, uh, this forms the roots of culture, right? Whatever culture or traditions we have, they're kind of ways to learn through social interactions. Yeah. Uh, certain behaviors can be explained by gene genetics and then, you know, response to environmental stimulus. So for example, um, uh, some sort of regulatory genes can be master regulatory genes which control many behaviors. And then there, it can also be that multiple genes will control a single behavior. So for example, like that bird you see in the uh, diagram, it's trying to crawl itself outside of the bowl uh, and you can see the scratch marks. This is kind of where it was trying to head. And the kind of experiment that it originated from was looking to see if migratory orientation uh, within species were genetically determined. <clears throat> and then they're able to kind of isolate two different locations of the same bird, but uh, what directions they would go in, that's the bottom image. You can see uh, the top circle are adult birds from Britain and off, uh, offspring of British adult birds. They would move mostly to the west. Whereas the bottom circle, those are birds from uh, Germany and they would move southwest. Oh, sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then they thought it was genetically based. Okay, then uh, we're going to move on more to the selection types. Uh, there's different types of selection, right? You'll have known natural selection, artificial, and maybe sexual selection from genetics. Uh, but the selection basically determines uh, who lives and who dies, uh, what types of genes are passed on, uh, are conserved, and it's really uh, related to evolution. So as we know, natural selection is when the more fit animals, organisms would pass on their genes and they get conserved into the gene pool. Uh, behaviors can also evolve this way, right? If we uh, go off of regulatory genes, then uh, whatever gene is conserved throughout different generations, that's the behavior that also gets conserved. Uh, but it can also be that if this behavior is no longer needed, then that gene no longer gets selected for, and then eventually gets away, goes away. Um, so then, uh, one one thing to know is there's a social kind of idea, social Darwinism, that was supposedly a form of natural selection, but it's not really scientific, and it should not be uh, considered. Sexual selection is uh, selection based off of uh, different genders, so there's uh, kind of different types of it. You have polygamous, which is multiple matings, uh, and then the two subtypes of that are polygamy and pol polygyny and uh, polyandry. So po po poly polygyny is when one male can uh, mate with multiple females, and then polyandry is the opposite of that one female, multiple males. Uh, this kind of depends on the you know environment and what social structure these organisms are going under that will determine if they're polygamous or not, and if they are, what type of uh, polygamy they uh, they use. Uh, this was a USABO question, I think, around 
two years ago. The on the last page they asked basically what was polyandry. And then you have the more well what humans usually do or mono mon monogamous. Sorry, but that's basically single mating. You have uh, one male, one female, and then sexual dimorphism uh, kind of relates to the differences between the two genders' phenotypes. So, for example, you see the ducks up there. The male duck is more colorful uh, than the female duck, and yeah. So then we're going to uh, mate choices kind of related to sexual selection. Mate choice by females. Um, this happens inter uh, as intersexual competition, but they will usually try to choose males with a specific behavior and anatomy. And right, because of selection, then whatever gets chosen is going to be kept throughout the next generation. Uh, then you also have... Uh, male competition for females is an intrasexual competition, but it involves uh, agonistic behaviors, which is, uh, well, in Campbell it was uh, covered earlier on in the chapter, but agonistic behavior, that's kind of the a type of behavior where uh, different animals will fight each other, so males will fight each other for the female. And then these, uh, these types of mate choices are what create kind of selective pressures that will favor certain traits over others and eventually, you know, which ones are kept, which ones are not. Okay. Then moving on to the next topic, altruism. Uh, altruism is kind of behaviors that are, that work to uh, improve fitness of others, uh, but does not really does not always improve the fitness of yourself. Uh, this is kind of uh, if you think about it, it's not really expected because we would try to maximize your own fitness to uh, pass on your own genes. So altruism is uh, different from that. There is kind of two types of altruisms: um, reciprocal altruism, which is when uh, altruistic behavior uh, there towards unrelated individuals you will kind of expect something in return uh, one way one example of that is certain sometimes bats will give uh, their food which is blood to other uh, weakened bats that are not really related and that's a, uh, that's a form of altruistic behavior because it's benefiting the fitness of another one. Uh, however, that bat who donated blood will respect uh, will expect blood in return. So this is that's the form of a uh, reciprocal altruism. There, uh, kin altruism is uh, altruism that is meant to benefit the fitness of related individuals and families. Uh, kin kin altruism can be uh, calculated with Hamilton's rule, or well, the ones on the. Uh, USABO usually ask for is it worth it to save your kin or not and then they give you these uh, situations they give you numbers to do it we're gonna go over uh, Hamilton's rule soon but first uh, example problem that might ask, oh, this is a real USABO question uh, by convincing soldiers that they are part of a brotherhood which increases the likelihood they will protect and die for each other the military is consciously or unconsciously tapping into genes that were adaptive in our ancestors because of. So then they give you uh, these answer choices. Uh, so here, think about it a bit, but kind of going off of what we were talking about, this is kin selection. Uh, kin selection, remember, is when uh, it's altruistic behavior that can help... Uh, can altruism it helps the related individuals or family of whoever is doing the altruistic behavior. So here, kind of uh, the brotherhood uh, topic that was in the question that signifies that oh they're probably kin, and altruistic behaviors you know trying to help them and protect and die for each other, which is 
not good for your own fitness, but it's good for the fitness of something else. Yeah. Okay, so moving on from that, we're going to cover Hamilton's rule. Hamilton's rule is this uh, inequality that you see there, RB is greater than C. Uh, the variables R is the relatedness coefficient, B is benefit, and C is cost. Uh, altruism is favored when uh, R times B is greater than C. So basically what all that meant was, uh, it's this is meant to kind of see if it's uh, beneficial to engage in altruistic behavior. Uh, on the bottom you see kind of a chart of the relatedness of coefficients, uh, co coefficients of relatedness are uh, this can be kind of calculated through genetics as well. If you're a parent to child, then kind of the there's a 0 0.5 pro probability of each chromosome or gene being passed on. So R is 0 0.5. And then as you go down, uh, when you have more relatives or unrelated, then the relatedness coefficient goes down. And kind of you, even by the uh, chart, you can relate this back to kin selection, but kin selection will weaken with hereditary uh, distance, right? If you have, <coughs> um, right, if you're uh, between you and your sibling, you have 0 0.5 as R, but if you have, let's say, you and your grandchild or grandparent, then you have 0 0.25, right? So co the R is lower. Anyway, if we use the question now, a mother antelope and child are galloping along the plains where they encounter a group of hungry lions. If the two antelopes try to escape the lions together, there is a 75% chance that both will be consumed and eaten, and a 25% chance that both will escape alive. However, if the mother sacrifices herself to the lion, she may be able to buy her baby additional time to escape. What is the minimum chance that the baby can have to escape from the lions following such a sacrifice? Uh, yeah. So here, again, we think back to Hamilton's rule, R, B, and C. So we're given, it's a parent and a child, so R is 0 0.5, right? If you go back to the... If you go back to the chart from the previous page, uh, R is 0 0.5. Uh, the question was asking for the uh, what chance of probability you, that we should have. Oops. Uh, but that the when we look at the variables, b is uh, supposed to be that probability, and c is the uh, chance of uh, the cost. And here we can see it's 25%, so uh, you can kind of think about what C would be. So when we put all the variables and their values together, the, we get the solution that I've been flashing upon the screen, but again, R is 0.5. Uh, here, we're gonna assign a variable for the probability because we wanted to know the maximum, or the, the probability. So B is P minus 0 0.25, or 0, and C is 0 0.25, which was the 25% chance of survival uh, being given up. That was uh, found in the question. You put the inequality together, 0 0.5 times the quantity of P minus 0 0.25 is greater than 0 0.25, and eventually you'll get that P is greater than 0 0.75. So then the answer to that uh, question is the minimum chance should be 75%. Okay, so uh, then we're going to do the uh, questions that were prepared for this topic. So I'm going to show these questions uh, because we're not in the live session, though, so I don't need to do the quizzes thing. But you can read the questions, uh, and then I'll go over the correct answers for each one. So question one. This term refers to addition of unpleasant stimulus. I put this in because I think they're important to know the, uh, this is part of, again, operant conditioning. But if you recall from the lesson, it's positive punishment. Pos a positive punishment is the uh, addition of something 
uh, that's unpleasant, right? Because you d you don't want to keep that behavior anymore and cause its punishment. Question two. This refers to uh, removal of something pleasant. This is still the same topic, operant. Uh, so you're trying to remove something pleasant, which means you're trying to decrease the behavior again. Um, so if you think back, decreasing behavior is done through punishment, so you can rule out both reinforcement types. Uh, and then you have to think, is it a positive punishment or is it a negative punishment? So if you think positive punishment, that's when uh, you'll add in something. Positive add, negative is remove. So positive punishment, you add in something unpleasant, which is not what the question is asking for. And that leaves a negative punishment. Three. When Mia gets back to the dorm after jogging around the campus, he likes to take a quick shower before going to class. One morning while he's taking a shower, he hears someone flushing a nearby toilet. Suddenly, extremely hot water comes rushing out of the shower head, and Mia exper uh, experiences excruciating pain. After that, he continues showering. And then a few minutes later, Mia hears another toilet flush, and he immediately leaps out of the shower. Uh, so, this is, again, if you think associative learning, is it operant learning? Not really. This, this is a uh, example of condi uh, classical conditioning. It's the stimulus thing. So, here we're going to go over kind of parts of that uh, diagram that was on the slide. What is the unconditioned stimulus? So, uh, unconditioned stimulus, remember, it's the first thing. Uh, it's the original stimulus. So, here, the original stimulus <coughs> is the cause of the response. And what would that be? That would be the hot water coming out of the shower head. Question four, same thing, but what is the unconditioned response? This is, again, remember, it's the original response to that situation and for it uh the original response it's a uh, kind of pain and then he jumps out of the shower this is uh that you know you uh ucs and then ucr the first line five same thing what is the neutral stimulus that becomes the condition stimulus so this is referring to the second line of that diagram Whereas, uh, where you add in a neutral stimulus and eventually, you know, with enough conditioning, it would become the conditioned stimulus. So here, the, the thing that changed is he hears the sound of a flushing toilet and that becomes conditioned or associated with uh, the hot water, right? So the neutral stimulus that becomes the conditioned stimulus is the toilet flushing, or rather the sound of the toilet flushing. And six, what is the conditioned response? This is the final response at the end. It's on the last line. Uh, but here it's just jumping out. So now the, those questions were kind of uh, ways for you to check your understanding on classical and operant conditioning. Let me go to seven. Uh, L. Lee. Ellie is a labradoodle who has a pup wood cover at the sight of a tiny leaf that flew near her. Now she is one year old and will forget everything and bound into the woods to chase a blowing leaf. This learning mode is... Uh, if you remember, what type of learning is that, that if it doesn't give you important information, then you just forget about it. Yeah, it's habituation. So this one's habituation. Next one, this last one is Boston is known for having aggressive geese along riverside paths, which frequently stand their ground ground rather than flee in response to rapidly approaching runners or bikers. City ordinance prohibits causing harm to these geese. At the individual level, what is the most likely ex 